Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll see how to read digital inputs and debout switches. Remember that you can always refer back to the PDF version of this tutorial, which you can download for free from the Gulagum Electronics website to fill in any details this video skims over. In the last lesson, we were still blinking LEDs. Now that's more useful than it sounds because with appropriate drive circuitry, you can replace that LED with any on-off device you want to control. But unless your device were just run a fixed output sequence, it's going to need to respond to inputs from the outside world. And the simplest type of input, which we'll look at in this lesson, are digital inputs, on or off, high or low. We use a simple push button switch, but it could be anything that indicates an on off status. Okay, I know I said at the end of the last video that we'd move to a bigger pick, but actually, let's stick with the 12 or 1501 for now. We'll use a similar circuit to before, with the LED still driven by the RA1 pin, but this time adding a push button switch connected to RA2. The 1K resistor isn't really needed in this example, but series resistors like this help protect the PIC's inputs from high or negative voltages, or from short circuits in case the pin is accidentally configured as an output. When the button is pressed, RA2 is pulled down to ground through the switch. Otherwise, it's pulled up to 5 volts through the 10K resistor, which is why resistors like that are called pull-up resistors. So, RA2 will be high when the switch is open, and low when the button is pressed. To build this circuit with the PIC training board, leave it set up as before, but also close jumper JP7, which brings the 10K pull-up resistor into the circuit. So now that we've got a switch connected to a pin, how can we tell whether it's open or closed? As we saw back in lesson 1, each I.O. pin can be configured as a digital input or output, except for RA3, which is input only. To configure a pin as an input, set the corresponding trist bit to 1. The state of each pin can then be read in the port A register. If the voltage on a pin is high, the corresponding bit reads as 1. If the input voltage is low, it reads as 0. So if the push button is pressed, the RA2 bit will read as 0. Otherwise, it will read as 1. Let's start with a really simple example. We'll just light the LED whenever the button is pressed. Sure, a simple circuit like this would do the job, but hey, we have to start somewhere. As usual, I'll base this example on the initialization code and structure we've used before. It makes sense, right? And again, I'll clear bit 1 of just A to make RA1 an output. Remember that for safety, the RA pins all default to input mode. So if we don't do anything else, RA2 will be an input. But I'll go ahead and set bit 2 of Trisay anyway, just to make it explicit. But although the pins are all inputs by default, they're not necessarily digital inputs. As we'll see in a later lesson, some of the pins can also function as analog inputs. And if a pin can be configured in analog mode, then by default it will be configured in analog mode. Again, this is for safety, because digital inputs draw too much current if an analog signal is driving the pin at some voltage that's in between high and low. So to use pins as digital inputs, you first have to disable any analog function on that pin. And we can do that by clearing the Ansel A register, like this. As I said, we'll go into more detail about analog inputs later. For now, we can just disable them. Remember that we want to set RA1 to turn on the LED whenever the push button is pressed and then clear RA1 whenever the button is released. That's easy! Since XC8 lets us operate on individual bits through the structures defined in the header files, we can simply copy the current value of RA2 into RA1, like this. Actually, we want the inverse of that, so that RA1 is high whenever RA2 is low, and vice versa. So I'll add the binary complement operator to invert RA2. With that inside our infinite main loop, the push button will be read, and the LED updated accordingly, as often as possible. Now if I compile this code and program it into the PIC, the LED lights whenever I press the push button. It's not very exciting though, is it? It would be better to turn the LED on when I press the button, and turn it off again when the button is pressed again. There's a problem with doing that though. Real mechanical switches have contacts that bounce. Too fast for human perception, to be sure but fast enough for the pick to see the switch go on and off a few times, really quickly, 
whenever the button is pressed. Let's see that in action. I've hooked an oscilloscope up to a push button, so I can see what happens when the button's pressed. The output's normally high, and it'll be pulled down to ground when I press the button. The scope's been set up to trigger on that, so we can capture the button press. So I'll press the button, and bang, there it goes. But it's hardly a clean transition. I'll zoom in a bit for a better look. There are definitely a couple of good bounces in there. I'll turn on some cursors so I can measure them. We can see that in this case, for this switch, the bouncing finishes after 133 microseconds. The first bounce starts 72 microseconds in, and the shortest bounce is just 9 microseconds long, which seems pretty short, but it's still plenty long enough for the pick to react to. So we need a way to avoid reacting to those short pulses. The written tutorial goes into more detail on this, but a common method, using hardware, is to use a simple RC filter to filter out the bounces, combined with the Schmidt trigger input to clean up the transitions. It's especially useful if your microcontroller already has Schmidt trigger inputs. The small picks are a bit limited that way. Only one of the 12F1501's general purpose digital input pins has a Schmidt trigger input, RA2, which, luckily enough, is one we happen to be using in this lesson. The other digital input pins only have ordinary TTL style inputs, which won't work as reliably with an RCD bounce filter. But since we are using RA2 in this example, it's okay to use this hardware approach. We already have the resistors in our circuit, so we only have to add a capacitor. 100 nanofarads is a good value in this case, and there's a 100 nanofarad capacitor supplied with the training board. You can fit it directly between the RO2 and ground pins on the 16 pin header, like this. But what if your only option is to use one of the digital pins that doesn't have a Schmidt trigger input? What if your design has to be so cost reduced you can't even afford to add a capacitor? Don't worry, you can still debounce the switch purely in software, which is what we'll look at a bit later. But first, we'll start with some code without any debouncing, which is all you need if you're using hardware debouncing. First, we wait for the button press. As long as the RO2 bit is set, the pick sits in this busy wait loop, just continually checking RO2. When the button's pressed, RO2 is zero, so we drop out of the while loop and can move on to toggling the LED, which we can do like this. Then we need to wait for the button to be released, ready to be pressed again. Similar to before, except this time, waiting for RO2 to go high. You'll find this code works just fine, with the filter capacitor in place. Take that capacitor out, and you'll find the LED doesn't always change reliably, because each contact bounce looks like a new button press. So now let's leave the cap out, and you bounce the push button in software. The easiest way to do that is to add a delay. The idea is simple. Respond to the button press immediately, so the device feels nice and responsive to the user, then wait a while, until we're sure that the button will have finished bouncing, before checking to see whether it's been released. Then we add another debounce delay to be sure the button's stable after the release, before going back and waiting for the next button press. How long to delay? It depends on your switch and your application. The switch I tested before always finished bouncing within a couple of hundred microseconds, so a delay of a millisecond should be safe. But it doesn't hurt to make it longer, as long as the button still feels responsive to the user. 10 milliseconds seems reasonable, so I'll just add a 10 millisecond delay after toggling the LED. Then again after the button's released. We're using XC8's delay macro again, so I need to define the processor clock frequency, the same as in the last lesson. We'll now find that you can reliably toggle the LED on each button press. There's still a potential problem though. Sometimes you get short spikes or glitches in input signals, maybe from some sort of electrical interference. But if you only have a simple debounce delay, there's no way to tell the difference between a glitch and the start of a switch closure. A common way to filter out spikes, as well as bounces, is to check that the switch stays consistently open or closed. When you detect that the button's pressed, you keep checking, until it's stayed down for long enough that you're confident that it's really pressed and it stopped bouncing. You can do that by periodically sampling the input and counting the number of times it's still in the new state. In other words, if a switch reads on enough times in a row, it's really on. We can pretty much write this algorithm directly in C, using a while loop like this. 
we were sampling the push button every millisecond. By the way, to use C99 standard integer types, such as unit8t, you need to include stdint.h in your code, like this. It's possible to restructure the debounce routine as a for loop, like so. It's a little shorter, but more importantly, it makes it a bit easier to see what's going on. Then we can debounce the button release in much the same way, just with the opposite bit test. Finally, if you're sure there won't be any input glitches, other than the switch bounces, there's actually no need to debounce the button press. If I delete the button press debounce routine, the press will still be acted on as soon as it's detected. And there's no need to explicitly wait for the button release, because the counting debounce algorithm is already doing that. So I can make the code a fair bit shorter, while still reliably toggling the LED each time the push button's pressed. The code's fine, but there's still an improvement we can make to the circuit. This arrangement of using a resistor to pull up an input when a switch is open is so common that most microcontrollers, including PIX, make them available internally. If you enable the internal pull-up, you don't need the external pull-up resistor. So it can go, and we're left with an even simpler circuit. To take the external pull-up resistor out of circuit on the training board, just remove jumper JP7. You'll find that our toggle LED code doesn't work very well anymore, so let's fix it. The internal pull-ups are enabled overall by the WPU EN bit in the option register. The option register controls a few other things, which we'll take a look at in future lessons. But to enable the pull-ups, we first need to clear the WPU EN bit. Just like the other registers, the X8 header files define symbols for the individual bits in option reg. The N in NWPU EN stands for NOT. It's a reminder that this bit works in an inverted way. We would need to write a 0 instead of a 1 to enable pull-ups. So we can enable pull-ups globally with a statement like this. I say globally because WPUEN is just an overall enable. When it's been cleared, pull-ups on individual pins can be enabled by setting the corresponding WPUA bit. So we can enable the internal pull-up on RA2 like this. A problem with that approach is that the pull-ups are all enabled by default. And if you're trying to minimise power consumption, you don't want pull-ups enabled on any unused inputs that you've tied to ground. In that case, you've run a clear the WPUA bits for any unused inputs. And we can do that in a single statement like this, using the left shift operator. Mind you, in this circuit the unused inputs have been left disconnected. So we should actually leave the pull-ups enabled, so the pins aren't floating. So I'll go back to the first version. When you compile this, you'll find that it now works fine with no external pull-up resistor. That's it for reading switches for now. In the next lesson, we'll see what timers are, and some of how useful they can be, starting with timer zero. See you there!